Over half a century ago, a deadly aerial contest was fought between the Royal Air Force and the invading German Luftwaffe in the skies over England. The RAF's victory in the Battle of Britain changed the course of the Second World War. The air defense units of today's RAF are the inheritors of this tradition, protecting the island of Great Britain against airborne threats. Located in the rolling countryside of northern Yorkshire, RAF Leeming is part of the 1118 group of the RAF Strike Command. During the Battle of Britain in 1940, the RAF was divided into Fighter Command and Bomber Command. In 1968, both elements joined to form Strike Command. Strike Command has 13 squadrons, including some that fly the Harrier Jump Jet and the Tornado Strike Fighter. 1118 Group specializes in the aerial protection of the United Kingdom and includes the Air Defense Wing at RAF Leeming. The group is also responsible for maritime defense, coordinating its actions with the Royal Navy's air support the fleet air arm. 1118 Group is the descendant of the legendary 11 Group of the Battle of Britain. At the outset of uh, the Battle of Britain, we were flying uh, Boston's and Bow Fighters in the night intruder role, and the squadron fairly quickly converted to Mosquitoes and then took over a night fighter and night intruder role. Uh, with that aircraft, the squadron deployed on night reconnaissance. Uh, sweeps over northwestern France and uh, claimed several kills to its credit. After World War II, there was a new concern. The Soviet Union's bomber force began flying simulated combat missions down the Norwegian coast toward British airspace. Today, the 1118 Group continues to protect British airspace from foreign airborne threats. As in the days of the Battle of Britain and throughout the Cold War, at 25 Squadron, crews are on ready alert around the clock, waiting for the scramble alarm to intercept an intruding aircraft. During peacetime, it's referred to as Quick Reaction Alert, or QRA. A typical peacetime mission might well be a QRA launch. QRA is held by the Air Force 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. It's shared between the air defense stations in the UK and at any given time there are always uh, four airplanes on one on readiness which is basically a 10 minute readiness phase which means theoretically that uh, within, the, within 10 minutes the hoot are going the airplane's got to be airborne and on its way to intercept whatever the radar site have found uh, on their radar scopes so for example out of here we'd get launched with uh, a 10 minute scramble 10 minutes after the hooter goes be in the airplane getting airborne out of here the initial intercept would lead to the aircraft generally being visually identified as whatever. It might be a civilian airliner that's lost or perhaps, heaven forbid, uh, the real thing, uh, an enemy aircraft uh, with, uh, with intent uh, to prosecute an attack. Having conferred uh, with the superior authority, uh, if it were, say, an airliner that needed assistance, then our job would definitely then involve shepherding the aircraft to an airport or redirecting it on its route. Uh, clearly, on the other eventuality, we might find ourselves having made an intercept, identifying the aircraft, and perhaps if we were at state of war at that point, um, being ordered to make an engagement.
With advances in aviation technology over the past half century, Britain's interceptor aircraft have experienced dramatic changes. The post-war years saw the steady improvement of fighter radar and jet technology. Aircraft such as the Javelin marked the next stage in interceptor design, capable of operations day and night at supersonic speeds. By the 1960s, missiles became the main armament of fighter aircraft, as epitomized by the Lightning Interceptor with its fire streak missiles. These advancements led to the Tornado F-3 Interceptor, a multinational program developed by Britain, Germany, and Italy. The basic version of the Tornado is a sophisticated ground attack aircraft. Its modification into an interceptor involved replacing its ground attack radar with the Fox Hunter radar, designed specifically for air intercept missions. The tornado surpasses its historical antecedent, the Spitfire, on many aspects. The Spitfire was a fraction of the size of a tornado, with a top speed of 355 miles per hour. The supersonic tornado has a top speed of nearly 1,000 miles per hour. The Spitfire had a combat radius of about 150 miles, compared to the tornado's combat radius of well over 750 miles. Armed with eight 30 caliber guns, the Spitfire's attack range was only a few hundred feet. Whereas the tornado can attack targets up to 30 miles away with its long range missiles. The Spitfire was effective only in clear daylight, while the tornado can operate effectively day or night in nearly all weather conditions. With its greater complexity, the management of the tornado requires two crewmen, a pilot and a navigator. We have two crew members. We have a pilot obviously in the front seat and the navigator in the back seat. The uh, difference in, in jobs is not as clearly defined as it used to be. It's more of a, a crew cooperation aircraft. Obviously the pilot's responsible for flying the aircraft, getting it safely off the ground wherever we're operating and back to the ground. But on the intercept side, we work very closely with the navigators. The role of the navigator has lost some of its meaning in latter-day uh, war fighting. Perhaps the description is better as the uh, American weapon system operator, if you will. Uh, certainly the navigator has primary responsibility for the safe navigation of the fighter. However, I would say upwards of 95% of these responsibilities revolve around uh, employing the weapon system, ensuring that the intercept geometry is just right to make the intercept and making sure that the ordnance is delivered accurately uh, and at the right point. The reason that the backseater is heavily involved uh, revolves essentially around the way in which the Tornado F3 has been developed as a weapon system. It would be virtually impossible for the aircraft to function with just a pilot, uh, equivalently without the controls, even the navigator in isolation could not run an intercept to uh, either weapons launch or identification by himself. So one relies upon the other. And certainly the generation of single seat fighter pilots in the Air Force has perhaps now disappeared with the demise of the Lightning. The Tornado F-3s are armed with a 27 millimeter Mauser cannon, Sidewinder missiles, and Skyflash supersonic mid-range missiles. One of the Skyflash's greatest strengths is its versatility. The latest version of this missile has a solid fuel rocket engine, giving it extreme range. It is capable of intercepting and destroying enemy targets at low or ultra-high altitudes. Although the Skyflash can be fired at shorter ranges, Sidewinder missiles are typically used by the Tornadoes for close-range engagements. The primary weapon is probably going to be the, uh, the Skyflash. That's a radar-guided missile. You probably call it a beam, beam riding weapon, if you like. Um, the, the parent uh, aircraft radar illuminates the target and bounces back a certain amount of uh, reflected energy, which the missile underneath the airplane can recognize. And it will follow that beam 
right down to, uh, to the point of impact and uh, destroy the target that way. It's, um, it's a slightly longer range missile than the uh, Sidewinder, which is the alternative. The Sidewinder is carried under the wings. The Sidewinder is uh, probably more commonly referred to as a dogfight missile, slightly shorter range. The difference is it, uh, it actually requ requires thermal energy to, uh, to target on. So instead of having a beam to ride down, it actually follows uh, a thermal source. The most obvious thing on an aeroplane, obviously, uh, is a jet exhaust. And basically, that's what you try and aim it at. The missile will see it and indicate to you by certain uh, indications in the cockpit. And then once you've fired it, it's basically fire and forget. Either the missile works or it doesn't work. There's very little you can do about it. In spite of recent changes in aeroplane technology, the essential element of aerial combat, the air crew, has not changed much since the Battle of Britain. I don't think the pilots are much different. The average age of my uh, junior officer pilots is around about 22, uh, perhaps actually a couple of years older than some of the pilots who fought in the Battle of Britain. But uh, to my mind, and many of these ex-Battle of Britain aces are now honorary members of the squadron, having fought with us, uh, there's a large similarity. I mean, they, have, they, say, they share a similar sense of humor, um, and they have a common interest, which of course is flying aeroplanes. Of course, the aeroplane is considerably different. This is now a two-seat aeroplane. It's a day and night capable, uh, fully all-weather capable, where, of course, in the Second World War, single-seat hurricanes, spitfires, tended to be daylight hours only, and tended to be clear air mass fighters, good weather. The sophistication of modern combat aircraft demands a great deal more training than cases during the Battle of Britain. Although the training regimen is now more elaborate, the basic fighter pilot skills remain very similar. They go through a common training process through officer training school and then through basic flying training. Not until that basic flying training phase is complete do we actually try to assess whether they've got the capability to become a fast jet pilot. About 50% have of those who make it successfully through that initial stage of training. What we're looking for uh, when, we, when we try to choose these people is, first of all, obviously ability, and that's the most important thing. Does he have the ability to think quickly under pressure? We're looking for a degree of aggression, but a controlled aggression, and uh, equally we're looking for determination, because obviously it's not the easiest job in the world, and you want someone really who has his mind set on becoming what we are today, fighter pilots. During training to become a tornado pilot, a candidate must advance through various training aircraft, each increasing in its level of complexity. Starting with the chipmunk trainer for elementary training, the pilot will then progress to basic training, flying the Takano turboprop trainer. The third and final stage is the British Aerospace Hawk Jet Trainer. Not just a trainer aircraft, the Hawk doubles as a short-range air defense fighter. It has also been built in ground attack and single-seat fighter versions. Perhaps the best known use of the Hawk is by the RAF's precision flying team, the world famous Red Arrows. Acknowledged as one of the world's premier aerobatic teams, the Red Arrows are the public face of the Royal Air Force. The team supports wider British aerospace technology interests through international promotion. Each year, the Red Arrows demonstrate British skill and industry to thousands of people worldwide. Today, new pilots flying the Tornado F-3 Interceptor are assigned to the wing at RAF Leeming, Lushars or Waddington. 
RAF Leeming is one of the largest tornado stations in Britain and one of the few fighter bases that still have strong ties to the Battle of Britain. In 1940, it was home to Blenheim Night Fighters of the 219th Squadron. Leeming was rejuvenated in the late 1980s with the arrival of the Tornado F-3s. Its modern facilities belie its historic RAF connections. Modern air bases have an elaborate network of concrete runways instead of the grass fields common during the Battle of Britain. With the use of jet engines, hard runways are an absolute must as debris sucked up from the ground can damage the delicate turbine blades. One of the most distinctive features of modern air bases is the hardened aircraft shelter, often called a HAZ. The HAZ is home for the aircraft and its crew. The ground destruction of the Egyptian Air Force in the 1967 Six-Day War propelled the construction of hardened shelters, which sprang up like mushrooms in both Eastern and Western Europe. The shelters are designed to withstand the near miss from high explosive bombs and are vented in the event chemical weapons are used. The HAZ is also used to conduct daily aircraft maintenance by the ground crew. When I joined the Air Force, I chose to be an engine mechanic. Um, I like the mechanical side of it and actually fixing things, changing things. My trade responsibility is for the jet engines, the oil systems and the fuel systems, but I'm also responsible for crewing in the air, the air crew, marshalling the aircraft and servicings. The Tornado incorporates a broad range of novel technologies. These sophisticated features were coupled with concerted efforts to simplify its maintenance compared to older RAF multi-engine jet aircraft. No, there's no comparison. The whole uh, idea of Tornado is to ease the maintenance uh, task, which they've done a reasonably good job on. Oh, the airframe is uh, far more maintain easier to maintain. Uh, access panels, modern access panels, where you don't need a fastening at all to undo fasteners, they just flip open. So it it's, uh, advances all around. While the ground crew prepares the aircraft for its next mission, the pilot and navigator suit up. The G pants designed uh, they have air pumped into them as G comes on an aircraft just to keep, stop the blood pooling in the bottom of your legs to keep the, as much blood as possible into the top half of your body. The immersion suit is uh, designed for going into the water. It allows you to, your skin to breathe while you're in the aircraft and walking around. But if you do go into the water, the, the web, the meshing in the material will close up and stop water getting in and keeping you dry. It's just air from the air conditioning system is blown through the hole. This one down the front is uh, to get in and out of. Got your uh, life jacket. This is when they made the tornado, they introduced the arm sleeves for arm restraints for a high speed ejection, where the arm restraints will, his part here will come down and pull your arms in so they don't move around and get broken. Then attach your G hose in. This will attach to the aircraft seat, so you've got uh, air going in there for your G-pants, your microphone, headset, radios through there, and your oxygen through there, coming up this hose here. In this pocket here you have the um, flares and other useful bits of, of kit just to use. If you stuck out in the sea or the hills, and that's where the beacon's kept. This here, if you pull this, will inflate the life jacket. Goes over the head, you've got a chin strap, straps to tighten up the headpiece on top of you. Your microphone then attaches in to connect you to the main part of the aircraft. Oxygen mask, hose goes straight in for the oxygen system, and then the mask then attaches up to your face. Got the two visors.
Following a pre-flight inspection, the aircraft stands by for its new assignment. The success of the tornado depends on the air and ground crew of the Air Defense Wing, as well as on the supporting units of Strike Command. A familiar sight to Tornado air crews is the massive VC-10 tanker aircraft. Used for mid-air refueling, the VC-10 can extend the endurance of the tornado from about two hours to more than 10 hours, with the tornado's internal fuel and occasional aerial connections. With refueling complete, the tornado proceeds on its mission. As capable an interceptor as the Tornado F-3 is, it is in the process of being replaced by the Typhoon, a multinational jet originally known as the Eurofighter 2000. The Typhoon is an agile, single-seat, multi-role aircraft optimized for high-altitude supersonic air combat. However, it is capable of operating at much lower levels in the ground attack role as well. One major advantage of the Typhoon is its ability to undertake swing roll missions. For these missions, a Typhoon can be equipped to engage in both air-to-air -air and ground attack missions in a single sortie. Switching between the two separate attack modes in flight, something not possible with a Tornado. With nine underwing weapon mounting points, Typhoons will be equipped with two advanced short-range air-to-air missiles, four advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles, as well as air-to-ground ordnance. It will take some time before tornadoes are completely replaced by typhoons. But regardless of the aircraft, the traditions established during the Battle of Britain will be carried on by the Royal Air Force with expertise and valor. <laughs>